Holy Titan. If you thought that last week's episode was packed full of lore and suspense, you've got another thing coming with Hunting Palisman. Not only do we get to know the Golden Guard's true identity, we also learn more about Bellus' past, his plans for the Day of Unity, Palisman, a burgeoning political coup, and the startings of a ship war that we should all agree now to be mature about. But don't worry. I'm gonna go over all of it. You're watching Whitney Vision, and this is our breakdown of the Owl House Season 2, Episode 6, Hunting Palisman. Before we get started, I wanna direct you over to the trending party on Twitter using hashtag SaveTheOwlHouse. Although it's too late to campaign for an extended Season 3, hopefully Disney execs will see how fervent this fan base is for more Owl House, and we might be able to get them to option spin offs, merchandise, comics, or maybe even a movie. Our goal is to make this fandom impossible to ignore and prove to Disney that we need more Owl House. One of the most important things we can do is binge season two part A when it drops on Disney Plus next Wednesday, July 21st. So y'all know what to do. Glue your butts to the couch and rewatch every episode. And make sure you tag your posts with hashtag Save the Owl House. This is your spoiler warning. If you haven't seen this week's episode, come back after your palisman has chosen you. All right, guys, there's no Lumity action this week, but honestly, I totally understand why. Aside from the fact that Amity is probably still blushing after kissing Luz, there was so much going on in this episode that I don't think another moment between them would have gotten the attention it deserves. So I'm cool with waiting another week to see what happens between them, but yeah, the suspense is killing me. I will say it's a little disappointing that Amity is missing out on all of these major Hexite events like the Palisman Adoption Day and the field trips to the Emperor's Castle. I want to see more of our girls navigate their crushes in front of their classmates. First things first, I don't know about you guys, but I immediately rewound and rewatched the first two minutes of the show before I could continue the rest of the episode. There was so much information in that two minutes alone, it all could have been its own episode. For example, I could have watched an entire B-plot just about the Covenheads. Because we already saw promo images from this scene, I was expecting to learn a lot more about them, like their names, their personalities, or what they want out of the Day of Unity. I'm honestly a little bit bummed out that we didn't even get to hear them speak in this episode, but I'm sure that we'll get to know these witches sooner or later. Starting clockwise, we've got the cutesy worm riding head of the Beast Keeping Coven and the mysterious head of the Bard Coven who totally looks like Ida's old friend. Then there's the unsettling head of the Healing Coven, the Dapper Illusion Coven head, and the Potions Coven head, who I'm convinced is Lemon Grab in disguise. Next, we have the Oracle Coven head, who appears to have multiple arms beneath his robe, followed by the Plant Coven head, who's giving off Olena Tyrell vibes, and the Construction Coven head, who looks almost exactly like the Construction Coven representative we saw in Covention. Lastly, there's the Abomination Coven head, front and center, with his badass lava lamp hair. His placement in frame and Alador's suggestion that Amity could be his predecessor makes me think that he'll be taking on a larger role than a majority of these other coven leaders. Right now, the only thing we do know about the coven heads is that they've been buying into Belos' plan for the Day of Unity sight unseen up until this moment. Kiki Mora says that they're finally being given a sneak peek of the plan after proving their loyalty and dedication to the Emperor's Coven. What they've done exactly to help further the plan along is still a mystery, however. Obviously, we know that the Coven heads and their scouts are responsible for luring the best and brightest witches into their ranks. But aside from that, I wonder what kind of sacrifices each of them have had to make for Bellos. There's no way he's just like, yay, you guys are doing a really great job of being club president. Like they have to be doing sinister deeds for him, right? My question is, what exactly has Bellos told them about the Day of Unity besides giving them a glimpse into what looks like Bonesboro fused with Burbank? I'm shocked that this is the first they're seeing these plans, because these are smart witches, y'all. What has Bellos promised them that has made them trust him so deeply? I know that everyone's always kissing his ass for saving everyone from the Savage Ages, but I don't understand why you would willingly join in on an evil plan without knowing anything at all about the plan. Bellos must have promised these guys something good to keep them interested. Perhaps they'll all get higher positions of power once the Human Realm and the Demon Realm are fused, or maybe he's promised them stronger powers, immortality, or another invaluable asset. Whatever the case, I'm dying to know each Covenhead's personal reason for joining. Are they power hungry? Or do they really believe that joining the two realms is the best thing for everybody? Do they want to rule over the humans? When the Covenheads remove their sigil brooches and place them around the cauldron, their combined powers create a preview image of what the Boiling Isles will look like once it's integrated with the Human Realm. Frankly, I don't know why the hell Bellos wants his home to look like downtown Glendale. 
Who would want to live in a normal city when you could literally live on the bones of an ancient titan? I mean, obviously it would be like really cool for humans if they suddenly got to live among a bunch of magical creatures like Hootie, but why are these coven heads so horny for structure and order? What happened during the Savage Ages that made them want to go from a cool secret magic universe to the suburbs? Side quest, did y'all notice the moon or eclipse during the Day of Unity premonition? This is definitely connected in some way to the celestial imagery we saw back in King's Castle. Bellos' plan is giving me major Hordak and low-key star butterfly vibes. Hordak, because that dude wanted nothing more than to boringize everything by turning everyone into a bunch of clones and ruining the beauty and magic of Etheria, and Star Butterfly because this dude is about to cleave Muni and Earth with a portal explosion. Unlike Star, however, I don't think Bellos has any intention of destroying all magic, but he's dead set on using it to create an orderly utopia by negating all wild magic. His use of the word utopia is making me think that perhaps he and the other coven heads are buying into this cult of the titan's will. Could there be real religious motivation for these witches? Whether you think Bellos is a descendant of, or Philip would have been himself, it's possible that stories slash memories of the human realm became more and more idyllic over time, meaning that Bellos might view Earth as a promised land. Unfortunately, Bello starts to get a tummy ache during the presentation because he's hungry pants for a palisman snack. Kikimura starts to go in after him, but the Golden Guard stops her, insisting that he can handle it alone. Of course, she totally follows anyway because she's a sneaky bee, and overhears their conversation while she lurks outside Bellos' chambers. Inside, Bellos starts anamorphing into a scary big boy. His body hulks out in muscles, his hands turn to claws, and wearing that horned mask isn't making his shadow any less spooky. He begins punching the wall as soon as he changes, and his arm and fist are covered in a thick, dark sludge. His monster form reminds me of Hexus, the villain from Fern Gully. That dude terrified me when I was a kid specifically because of the way his body was formed out of that same horrifying goop. But unlike Hexus, who was made out of oil, grime, and poisonous slime, could Bellos be made out of… mud? Hear me out. Remember the first secret code from season 1? Two witches torn apart, now alone, two hearts of stone, a curse of feathers and mud, a betrayal of blood. We've assumed that this curse of feathers and mud was referring to Ida, Lilith, and the Owl Beast, but what my newest theory presupposes is… maybe it's about Bellos? We learn that the Golden Guard is being raised as Bellos' nephew, so if we take this as truth, could Bellos have a sibling who betrayed him or vice versa? Instead of Ida and Lilith being the witches torn apart by a curse, it was Bellos and his sibling. He is alone now, and his heart is particularly more stone-like than both Season 1 Ida and Lilith. Also, if you run with the other theory that Bellos is related to the Rock Guardians from King's Castle, his heart could literally be stone. This theory does create a giant question mark over the Curse of Feathers portion of the code, but clearly there's more to be revealed as we eventually learn about how the Golden Guard ended up a ward of Bellos. Perhaps Little Rascal the Cardinal Palisman originally belonged to one of Gigi's parents. If that's the case, maybe that's why he sought out the Golden Guard as his new owner. His scar does imply that he's seen some things, so maybe he was present during this wild magic betrayal Bellos is hung up on. It's interesting to theorize that Bellos' story may rhyme with Ida's, because we get to see two extremely different versions of coping with curses. We have Ida, who used her tenacity, independence, and punk rock attitude to forge her own path embracing wild magic. She was able to find a treatment for her curse that allows her to live her life with fewer limitations than she would without her elixir. And despite the fact that even the healing coven couldn't figure out how to heal her, she found the strength to advocate for herself, build her own unique life, and even relearn how to do magic without her bile duct. And above all, she found a way to repair her relationship with Lilith. Bellos, on the other hand, fears wild magic and craves rigidity and the expected. Whatever happened to him caused trauma that made him feel powerless. And now, he's taking that out on the Boiling Isles to the extreme. Whether it was metaphorical or literal, Bellos lost his entire family to wild magic. To be fair, I do have empathy for where he's coming from. Trauma and curses affect everyone differently. And just because Ida was able to make certain choices for herself, Bellos isn't Ida. His experience is his own, and his need to feel like he's in control is what my therapist would call overcorrection. Instead of acknowledging that what happened to him was awful, but that not all wild magic is bad, Bellos engages in black and white thinking. He thinks that all wild magic can only lead to pain, and that it must be eradicated for the greater good. Bellos, babe, come to DBT with me next week. A little dialectical behavior therapy might help you work out some of these fears in a healthier way. But 
but just because I empathize with Bellows doesn't mean I don't think he's just a straight up evil dude. You can experience trauma and still be a butthead. The two aren't mutually exclusive, you know? He's literally causing a palisman extinction because he's over-harvested the Boiling Isles' palestrum wood resources. Not to mention all the people he's petrified and his bonkers plan to destroy wild magic. Men will literally merge the human and demon realms instead of going to therapy. The Golden Guard, however, is not a lost cause in the fight to save wild magic from extinction. Despite constantly hearing how terrible it is from Bellos, Homeboy has been doing his own research. He's turning out to actually be a giant magic geek. Not only has he studied a way to harness wild magic to create more palismen without the need for more wood, he's got a whole secret reserve of knowledge about it. Of course, Bellos would never even entertain the idea, so he instructs Gigi to go find him more palismen at any cost. The Golden Guard is in luck because it just so happens to be Palisman Adoption Day at Hexide. Because of the shortage of palestrum wood, Edith suggested to Principal Bump that they do a Palisman Adoption Day instead. With the help of the Bat Queen, Ida delivers a gaggle of lost palismen that the Bat Queen has been raising as her own. Adopt, don't shop, people! Each of the students has the opportunity to bond with a specific palisman that chooses them based on their strengths and interests. The adoption process is kind of like the sorting hat mixed with Ollivander's wand shop. Although the palisman chooses you, stating your intentions clearly and with conviction is extremely important. If you don't really know what you want, a palisman won't go home with you. Willow wants to be wise and powerful with the ability to protect everyone she loves. But she low-key also wants to destroy her enemies. Because of her tenderness and tenacity, she's chosen by Clover, a sweet little bumblebee palisman. Bumblebees are often seen as symbols of community and personal achievement. Bees are dedicated and hardworking, and nothing will distract them from their task. The way that they fly from flower to flower, pollinating them and allowing more life to grow, represents the interconnectivity of all living things. Not only are bees vital to nurturing life, but they can also pack quite the sting, just like our powerhouse Willow. Despite initially not wanting a hand-me-down palisman, Basha is chosen by Maya the Crab for her competitive spirit and desire to rule at Grudgeby. Crabs traditionally symbolize protection and rebirth because of their ability to shed and exchange their hard exoskeletons for another. Crabs are defensive creatures, which makes perfect sense for Basha on and off the Grudgeby field. Viney wants to open her own veterinary clinic for mythical pets, so she's selected by a tiny manticore palisman. These mythical hodgepodge creatures date back to late 300s BC and are commonly composed of the head of a man, body of a lion, and tail of a scorpion. The common association for manticores is power and strength, but likely this palisman represents the multitude of mythical creatures Viney cares for. Gus acknowledges that his dad wants him to become a master illusionist, and that he'll be able to easily do that while simultaneously working as the ambassador to the human realm. He also wants to establish contact with the giraffes, a prospect that should strike fear into the hearts of his classmates. He's chosen by a chameleon palisman, which symbolizes adaptability. Chameleons may blend into the background, but they're also capable of great change. Obviously, this makes sense for Gus as an illusionist, but after the personal growth he made in the last episode, I'd say Gus is admirably adaptable, especially when it comes to protecting what he believes in. This spiky-headed guy whose name I do not know just wants to make it to graduation, so he gets the most adorable little sloth palisman. Sloths are most commonly known for their patience, relaxation, and energy conservation. They symbolize the ability to take a step back and truly observe a situation from all sides before reacting. Considering all options and taking things slow and steady are a sloth's best qualities, but in terms of productivity, it can also mean a disinclination to action. AKA, you lazy dude. We also learn that Principal Bump's palisman Freewin can hop off his head and become a staff. His palisman doubles as an aid to his vision. Bump is missing his left eye and has a scar over his right, but with his palisman he's able to see out of both eyes. Side quest, can we just talk about how Principal Bump is sexy underneath that little hat? I'm sorry, but he is giving me mega Andrew WK vibes with that long ass silky hair. Like, damn, is that what Brett's gonna look like when he's an old guy? Because if so, I am down. The other unadopted palismen are a little less straightforward. There's a hermit crab-like creature, which according to my preliminary research could eventually bond with a cautious yet adventurous witch. Then there's what I'm going to assume is a dog-like monster, which might end up bonded to a particularly loyal witch. There's a vegetable palisman that I assume would be a great partner to a witch in the plant track. This handsome weirdo has a primordial soup vibe. You know, the kind of creature that existed before the dinosaurs when biology was throwing everything against the wall to see what stuck. I'm guessing a creative and flexible witch might make a good pairing for this one. 
This Goose with a Bell is likely a reference to the Untitled Goose Game, a video game where you bring chaos to a village as a goose. Part of said chaos is stealing a bell. So, uh, I guess this palisman will pair with someone with a lot of annoying, chaotic energy. This cat palisman also reminds me of a video game character, Mew from Pokemon. I bet they're looking for someone who embodies wisdom and curiosity from the Oracle Coven. Then there's this Spider-Pig hybrid, which has to be a reference to Spider-Ham from Marvel or Spider-Pig from The Simpsons. If John Mulaney ever guest voices a character, this has got to be his palisman. Lastly, there's the Cardinal, but we'll get to it a little bit later. Because Luz doesn't know exactly what she wants to do with her witch powers in the future, she isn't chosen by any palisman, so she returns to school later that night to attempt a bond with one of them. That's when the Golden Guard swoops in and kidnaps the palisman in their crate with Luz still trapped inside. She manages to disarm him, but his ship is attacked by a gigantic dragon made out of hands. Whitney, what does this monster symbolize, you ask? I don't know, nightmare fuel? The dragon crashes the ship, and Luz, the palisman, and Gigi land scattered on the ground near the ruins. When Luz comes to, she realizes that Kikimura planned the accident, and that she intends to kill the Golden Guard. Luckily, Luz is able to convince Gigi to escape Kikimura with the palisman so that she can't A, kill him, or B, deliver the palisman to Bellows herself. Gigi is still hell-bent on making those sweet little babies into smoothies for the Emperor, so he reluctantly agrees to a temporary truce. While working together, Luz learns a lot about the Golden Guard. For starters, his real name is Hunter, which I did not see coming, and he doesn't have a working magic bile duct like most of the witches on the Boiling Isles. Like Luz, Hunter has had to learn a different way to perform magic, but his powers come from the magic tech staff given to him by Bellows. It turns out that he's never even seen or heard of glyphs, despite his extensive studies of wild magic. This surprised me. He revealed that he knows a ton about wild magic that he can't tell Luz because the information is so highly classified, but he's never come across a glyph before? Man, Bellows must really be keeping a lot of things under lock and key in the Emperor's Coven. Although he doesn't know about glyphs until Luz introduces them to him, Hunter has read the same book she has, From Bones to Earth, A Study of Wild Magic, that sounds suspiciously like something Philip Wittebane had a hand in ideating. Obviously, the only written work we've seen his name attached to is his diary, but I'm wondering if the person who wrote this study of wild magic was inspired by his writing at all. Ida did pickpocket the author once, so maybe we'll find out more about the contents of his studies later on. He does reveal that the glyphs and nettles Luz uses to create a sleeping mist to knock out Kikimura is very similar to a wild magic spell he read about from the Savage Ages. Hunter is also afraid of palismen, convinced that because they're made of wild magic, they're inherently dangerous. But clearly, this little guy has other plans. The Red Cardinal Palisman bonds with the Golden Guard, and ultimately chooses to follow him back home to the Emperor's Coven. Cardinals represent true love, devotion, and monogamy in indigenous cultures. According to native folklore, if a cardinal crossed your path, you would soon find everlasting love. In Christianity, Catholics adopted the name cardinals for high-ranking church officials because of their red robes, and they were used as a reminder of the blood sacrifice Jesus made for his followers. The Cardinal Palisman here could easily be a harbinger of trust, friendship, and lasting relationships in Hunter's future. But we can't just ignore the fact that they're also a harbinger of love, right? After this week, I think Lumity Shippers might have some competition. It's yet to be determined what sort of character dynamic Hunter will have with Luz long term, but some fans are seeing sparks. I can see where they're coming from. Hunter's pretty cute in a Zuko sort of way. He's a bad boy who clearly needs to be shown unconditional friendship and loyalty after years of being brainwashed by the Emperor's Coven and used by Bellows. Does he even have any friends his own age? He definitely needs a homie or two. And I think that there's a possibility that he'll flip on Bellows and join the Bad Girl Coven once he's shown a little basic compassion and decency for a change. I'm already anticipating the deluge of comments saying that Lumity is the only ship they'll accept and that it's queer baiting to introduce a possible straight relationship into Luz's life. But let me gently remind y'all that Luz is bisexual, and that she has every right and opportunity to crush on whoever she wants. As a bisexual woman, it doesn't make you any less gay to date a man or a non-binary cutie. A super, super important part of bisexual visibility is respecting the fact that we can crush on literally anyone and everyone, and that it isn't a betrayal of queer representation to ship Luz and Hunter. 
Confining Luz to only being allowed to feel attracted towards Amity would honestly be a prime example of bi erasure and biphobia, so let's please, please, please be sweet in the comment section if anyone decides to ship these two. It's okay to think that these two nerds from opposite sides of the track might make an interesting couple, even if Lumity is still on the table and more gratifying for you personally. As of right now, Luz is technically not in a committed partnership with anyone, so I say it's fine by me if she thinks Hunter is cute and vice versa. I can already feel the chaotic energy coming from a thousand yet-to-be-written Hermione and Draco-style fanfics, and I'm here for it. Star-crossed lovers from the human realm and the Emperor's Coven, alike in their magiclessness and dedication towards becoming powerful witches in spite of their non-existent bile ducks. Tell me that's not an amazing love story, y'all. I'm obviously still Team Lumity for Endgame. I mean, I literally start all my videos with Lumity updates, but I also know that love triangle tropes aren't anything new to the YA genre. Let's see how this all plays out before we start waging war with other Owl House fans. Remember, at the end of the day, we're all trying to rally for more Owl House, so the last thing we want to do is turn potential fans off from the fandom by flinging hate amongst ourselves. Also, if you've liked what you've seen of Lumity so far, trust that Dana and the writers have the finesse to keep that ship afloat. I believe we can all happily experience this series if we treat each other with respect. Back to the story. After Luz returns the palisman to safety at Hexide, Ida and King gift her with a chunk of palestrum wood stolen from the Bonesboro Garden Club. Although she still isn't sure what she wants to carve or what she wants to ultimately use her magic for, her Owl House family is there to support her no matter what she decides. Personally, I think that her palisman should be a pug, but that's just me. Knowing Luz, my guess is that she'll pick a member of the feline family or an otter to be her magical bestie. There's also the strong possibility that she ends up complementing Hunter's cardinal with a blue jay. For starters, the palace from wood Ida stole her is naturally blue in hue. A blue jay would also fit in with Albert, Lilith's Raven, and Hoxley, solidifying Luz's role as an honorary clawthorn. And lastly, this is Dana's current Twitter profile pic. Hmm, I wonder if that's a hint. We also don't know what type of palisman Amity will get. Will the Bat Queen let her adopt another abandoned palisman? Or did she miss the opportunity because she wasn't at school that day? Will Amity have to carve her own? Or will she set off on a quest to find her magic soulmate animal elsewhere? In the final scene, we see Hunter return to the Emperor's Coven empty-handed, much to Bellos' dismay. He gets big mad when the Golden Guard suggests that he divulge how and why wild magic hurt him, and instructs him to get with the program and start succeeding. Hunter just kind of yes-sirs his way out of it after that, but my question is, why didn't he tell Bellos about the literal coup that just almost happened? Doesn't his uncle want to know if one of his high-ranking officials tries to murder him? I know that he probably didn't say anything because he didn't want Bellos to find out about Luz and the Palisman setback, but I'm shocked that he's just letting Kiki get away with attempted murder like that. Also, what does Kiki Mora want? Is she jealous that Bellos is closer to Hunter than he is to her? Does she want to be his right-hand man, running errands for him and taking care of him when he gets all muddy? Was she also this jealous of Lilith? Or is there something specific about Hunter that she doesn't like? I assume that like the rest of the coven heads in Hunter, Bellows promised Kiki ultimate power and glory if she helped him with the Day of Unity. So what more does she want? Just a higher title? Better health insurance in the EC? Whatever the case, I have a feeling that Hunter is going to become disillusioned by the Emperor's Coven pretty soon. Not only did someone just try to kill him, he also has to protect his new little palisman friend, and he's bound to discover that wild magic isn't all bad. Also, Homeboy has a sprig stuffed animal from Amphibia and a plush of Remy from Big City Greens, so we know that he has good taste in cartoons. If he keeps hanging out with Luz, there's no way he's going to continue serving Bellows, so I have my fingers crossed for an epic double agent heist episode where he works with Luz from the inside to take the EC down. Lastly, let's break down this week's secret code. Last week, the code read, Seething Seas and Puppet Strings. And this week, we have the word he starting the next sentence of the code. I wonder who the he is that it's referring to. Bellows? Hunter? Philip Wittebane? King? Someone else? I guess we'll have to wait until next week to find out more about the sentence. Man, that was a lot of information in one little episode. I want to know what you all think in the comments. What exactly happened to Bellos? What kind of palisman will Luz and Amity get? Let me know down below, like and subscribe to Whitney Vision, and check out our Patreon if you'd like to donate some money to feed our pug. I'm Scarlet Witt, and you're watching Whitney Vision.